Well, welcome everyone. I'd like to kick off the occasion today. Uh, I'm Sandy Williams, Gladstone president, and uh, it's really wonderful for me to look out again at this symposium and see so many uh, familiar faces, uh, friends and supporters of Gladstone who, who gather faithfully when we call. Uh, it's also nice to look out and see some new faces uh, that our older friends have brought, uh, brought with you today, and I look forward to meeting many of you. Um, Gladstone couldn't exist and prosper uh, without the kind of support we, we, we get from our, our community and those that believe in our mission. Um, and we feel we owe you something back for that. We owe you the accomplishments of our scientists and uh, the things that they do to overcome uh, uh, dread diseases. But we also owe you something more immediate. Um, uh, I see Stacia Obrimsky here. Uh, she's coined this phrase, a front row seat for what's happening in science. Uh, so that's been a memorable term, and we hope to provide that to you today. Around a topic that I pretty confidently can say is of interest to us all. So uh, I'll, I'll express that in a very personal way. Just about every morning I get up and stagger into the bathroom, wash my face, get ready for the day. And I look in the mirror and say, who is that old guy <laughs> looking at me out of the mirror? That's not me. I mean, in my internal landscape, I think of myself probably the way I looked at 30. And, uh, and I expect that's the way everybody else should be perceiving me. Uh, but then I look in the mirror and something's not right with this picture. So, um, I think aging is an issue that affects all of us and, and is, is of interest to all of us. Um, but uh, I'd have to say there's probably no area of health-related interest that has more confusion and, dare I say, more nonsense in the field uh, than the field of aging. Open up any newspaper or magazine, you'll see every Im imaginable brand of huckster trying to sell us something that would delay the aging process. Um, sell us their books, their magazines, or, or, or their products. So um, there's a lot of misinformation in this field. And as part of your front row uh, seat for good science, we'd like to tell you some stories that we hope would make you a more discriminating uh, customer in this effort we all make uh, to have ourselves age a, a little more slowly. So let the buyer beware, caveat emptor in this field, uh, but we hope you'll come away uh, from today feeling, feeling better informed. Um, there are three key words uh, or terms that I'll introduce because you'll hear them over and over from our group of speakers. And I want, I'd like for you to leave today with a better understanding of these three terms. The first term is aging itself. What is aging? Um, I think scientists and many of us used to think aging is just wear and tear. Uh, we go through life, we suffer bumps and bruises, and, and things just kind of wear out. Uh, there is some of that. There's some truth to that. That does go on in our cells and our tissues. But what we've learned more recently from the science of aging is that aging is actually a regulated process. Uh, it's not completely programmed. It's not like our fates are set when we're born in our genes, but it is regulated. And some of what we each are, the pace at which we age in various tissues and organs, does have a strong genetic basis. We have inherited at some part the rate at which we age, but that's not the sole determinant. Uh, the way we live, factors that uh, come into our bodies, uh, habits we have, what we eat, uh, uh, all of those things create a very powerful effect to, to regulate the pace of aging. And we're learning more about that. This is quite dramatic in uh, animals that don't live as long as we do naturally. In organisms like uh, worms or fruit flies or, or even mice that we study in the laboratory, 
we can do things to those animals that will cause them to live twice as long, six times as long, very dramatic changes in rate. And we're learning about the genes that control that. It's much harder to do good research in animals like us who, who, who can live 100 years. Uh, most of our grants don't last that long. Um, so it's much harder to discriminate fact from fiction, but what we're learning from these lower organisms does provide clues as to what can happen in, um, in ourselves. So the first term is think about what aging really means. The second term is epigenetics. You're gonna hear that mentioned several times. I think we all understand genetics. That's what we inherit from our parents, and that determines to, a, to some degree what we are, uh, what we become. But epigenetics means the things that aren't programmed in the sequence of the DNA, but affect how the genes work, which ones are turned on or turned off at different times. And this is an exploding field of science. We can understand now the biochemistry of how epigenetics works. We can map it, we can measure it. And what we're learning is that the aging process can be regulated by epigenetic factors, some of which may ultimately come under our control. So aging and epigenetics. And then the third term is disruptive, disrupting aging. That's the title of our talk today. We didn't wanna just talk about aging or explain aging. We want to disrupt it. So I looked up the definition of disruption. This actually is a term that was popularized in Silicon Valley. It means an innovation that creates a new market by applying a different set of values, which ultimately and unexpectedly overtakes an existing market. I really hope this happens in the aging market. The market that's out there needs to be disruptive <laughs> because it's mostly full of nonsense. Uh, and I think what you'll hear today is a start of how we can uh, tell the, the fact from the fiction there. Now, I'm also going to give you the conclusion or the other uh, message I hope you go away with at the end of the day first, and uh, I hope we'll come back to that at the end. First, uh, there really are no shortcuts in the search for cures to, to dread diseases, and I think that includes the search for things that would help us age slowly. There are no shortcuts. Uh, people try to invent those, but they're mostly wrong. The best hope, and I dare say probably the only hope for uh, stopping Alzheimer's disease, reversing heart failure, stopping many of these diseases that affect us uh, worse as we age, is deep biological exploration. That's what you're going to hear, people doing that. This is where the solutions, if they're to be found, will lie, and of course this is what we do at Gladstone. So I'm going to turn the program over now to my capable and entertaining colleague, Eric, uh, Eric Burton. Thank you very much. I think it's a pleasure uh, to be here, to welcome you to Gladstone. I think I love talking about aging. Uh, it's a field that my lab started working on about 15 years ago, and it, it's a field that's exploding. And so I'm really excited to be sharing this, this enthusiasm. Now, if, if you think about aging, the first thing to, to start with is to really look at what has happened during the last 160 years. We, we've had a, a dramatic increase in our average lifespan, and not only in our lifespan, but also in our health span. And by health span, we mean the number of years that we live healthy. And the two so far have grown into in parallel. So uh, one of the worries that people have when I tell them I work on aging, many ask them, what, what would you want to... Uh, live older and sicker. Well, the, the, the reason is that whenever we've been able to increase lifespan, health span has followed. And if you look at, again, what has happened during the last 120 years, in, in the year 1900, the average life expectancy was 50 years old. So I, I just, uh, those of you who are above 50, and I'm among you, um, uh, this is actually quite frightening. Today it's about 80, so a dramatic increase. In fact, if we look during the last 160 years, every year the average life expectancy has increased by, by a quarter of a year. So project this 100 years from today, uh, we will live 20, 25 years longer, so the average lifespan uh, will be about 100 years, average. And this means a lot of people will live older. So one, uh, the skeptics will say that uh, there's no reason that this will happen because we're actually reaching the peak, and there's no evidence for us reaching any peak. Actually, the line has been growing steadily 
straight uh, for the last 160 years. And one of the reasons we're so excited to bring you today is that up until 10 years ago, it was hard to understand how we were going to move from all the accomplishments of the 100, last 160 years, which were uh, nutrition, sanitation, vaccination, and antibiotics, which are the four major drivers of why we are here today. It was very hard to understand what were going to be the next step. And so what has happened during the last 15 to 20 years are a number of key discoveries in our labs and, and many other labs. And actually UCSF and Gladstone have, have played really pioneer, pioneering role in, 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 this, in this work. So these four major accomplishments that have been uh, brought uh, to the front and that give us optimis that we, optimi optimism that we will go to the next stage are uh, first the understanding that there are, as Sandy mentioned, there are a number of genes uh, and genetic pathways that control aging. So aging is not s just falling apart. And this was the old view of, uh, of aging. You know, your joints break, everything breaks a little bit. There are pathways, unique pathways, that actually are remarkably conserved between a very small organism that live 20 days and us. For example, uh, Cynthia Kenyon across the street discovered a gene called DAF16 uh, in a worm. This worm lives uh, uh, normally 20 days. If you mutate that gene, the, lives, the worm lives 40 days. Well, the same, the, what we call the ortholog, the same gene in humans, is called FOXO3A, and is one of the strongest predictor uh, whether you will live uh, above 90 in humans. And this is across all human species. So genetic pathways, the, the, the the wiring of the system that controls aging is conserved all the way from the small worms uh, all the way to humans. And so this gives us um, hope that by uh, learning how to tinker with these pathways using small molecules, for example, drugs, we will be able to also uh, modulate aging in humans. And actually, that's the second. So the first disruption is genetic pathways can control aging. The second, which is a direct corollary to this, uh, is that drugs that target these pathways can also increase lifespan and health span. And in the last 10 years, actually in the last five years, there have been two uh, molecules identified that can increase lifespan in mice. And they increase lifespan up to 30%, which uh, translate this into a human, is a 50-year increase in lifespan. Actually, a 30 to 50 years increase in lifespan, which is pretty remarkable. And one of the most remarkable thing about one of these drugs is actually we have not found the maximal dose. People have been testing and giving it more and more and more, and lifespan keeps increasing. So there's hope that it, we could go up to 50%. These are also single drugs. There's a hope that by com combining drugs, um, we might actually do even better. Now, you probably wonder who is going to uh, take a drug to live older. Well, I bet that some of, the, some of you in the room are already taking one of these drugs, and one of the, that drug is called glucophage or metformin. It is the most prescribed drug for uh, type 2 diabetes. And the remarkable thing about this drug is that the clinical trials that have been conducted in hundreds of thousands of people uh, with, on that drug have shown that the diabetics who take that drug actually live longer than the non-diabetics, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And so uh, this, these are uh, cross-sectional studies. So these are not studies that were conducted for the purpose of testing aging. They were just observational studies. And in medicine, the next step will be to actually really test it in a direct way, and especially in non-diabetics, what happens if a non-diabetic takes this drug. So, this is the type of, uh, of, of information that gives us great hope. So genetics, drugs. The third one is um, the environment. So if you were born uh, with bad genetics uh, you, and we don't, yet, we don't yet have drugs, uh, what, what should you be doing? Actually, there's a whole series of interventions that have been identified. Uh, a very good example is the so-called blue zones. I don't know if any, any of you have heard about those. Uh, Dan Butner is a scientist who has actually looked for areas of the world where people live older. And there's a number of key uh, loci. Uh, uh, Loma Linda in California, actually, uh, is a place where Seventh-day Adventists live. They, on average, live 10 years longer than all of us in California, or most of us in California. Um, there's uh, Sardinia in, in Italy. 
Uh, there is a place in Costa Rica. Uh, there is also Okinawa in Japan. So all of these places are fossil where people uh, actually turn to be living longer. So there's been an opportunity to study what is it about living there that makes people living uh, longer. And a number of key variables that many of us know, but not all of us apply, actually have been identified that, that, that play, we think, a key role. And these are exercise, nutrition, uh, well-balanced diet, not eating too much, uh, exercising regularly, but also uh, strong social contact, uh, so a strong sense of community. And so uh, I invite you to go and visit that website. It's actually quite interesting to see uh, what, uh, what can contribute to, to your longevity. Um, so this is the, the second variable that people have, have, have studied, drugs. And, um, and, and the environment. And the last one, the last uh, disruption or, or really novel finding uh, in terms of aging research is the realization that the pathways that drive aging or lifespan appear to be the same that drive a number of diseases that we call the, the chronic diseases of aging. And these chronic diseases of aging are actually what afflicts many of us in our Western civilization. And this is, uh, heart disease, heart attacks, or atherosclerosis, strokes, um, osteoporosis, bone thinning, uh, type 2 diabetes, and some forms of cancer. For all of these conditions, the major risk factor is how old you are. And you might think, well, this uh, has really nothing specific uh, about being old and being sick. But it turns out that for a number of other diseases, being old is actually protective. So we know that uh, for the disease that I just summarized, your age is your major risk factor, independently of anything else. I mean, your cholesterol can also play a role in heart disease, but your age is still a stronger predictor. Now, what this means is that and there, there's a lot of um, work showing that the pathways that I've alluded to, these pathways that determine lifespan and aging, are also at work in, in these chronic diseases. And so the hope is that by studying these conditions, uh, the chronic diseases of aging, we will understand aging better. And conversely, by studying aging per se as a pure process, we will understand these conditions. And the evidence that's emerging is that Many of the manipulations that we uh, are using against one of these conditions, for example, let's say metformin, uh, which actually protects you against diabetes, it turns out also protects you against cancer. And, and, and so we, we think that we, as we continue to study these processes in the future, future we will hopefully go to a, a unifying theory of aging that will allow us to understand the major risk factor for all of the conditions we're talking about. And I think this is where uh, the tremendous excitement for all of us come. Uh, Gladstone, as you know, is built on three different institutes, but uh, the more we're moving, every year that moves forward, I think we realize we're all speaking the same languages and actually end up studying the same proteins. And you will hear some example of, for example, Lee, who's uh, studying uh, P300 and inflammation, uh, is actually studying things that we've been studying in the immune system or in, in aging as well. So I think, uh, on this, I will stop. I think we will have an opportunity later in the, in the question to uh, answer all of your questions. I very much look forward to interacting with all of you and enjoying the question and answer. And um, I will now uh, invite to the podium um, John Newman, who will be describing actually some of the work that we conduct uh, in, in my lab. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So I'm going to be telling you all about a couple of things that we're working on in the lab to try to find new and better metformins, to try to gain a deeper understanding of how aging is regulated with the goal of developing therapeutics. And then I'll give you a geriatrician's perspective on how we might use those therapeutics uh, to, well, hopefully to disrupt the practice of medicine and to improve the lives of millions of people. But first, I'll tell you about one person in particular, my grandma, Nan. So when Nan was a spry young 80-year-old, she took care of her garden all by herself walking around, bending over, pulling the weeds, planting the eggplant, harvesting the rutabagas, all by herself. And then in what seemed like the blink of an eye, suddenly she couldn't do it anymore. And this is something that's familiar to many of you through your parents and your grandparents. Why not? Uh, and it wasn't just the arthritis in her fingers. It wasn't just that she was losing sensation from neuropathy. It wasn't just the, the osteoporotic fractures in her back. It wasn't just the sciatic pain. 
It wasn't just the frailty and the weakness. It, it wasn't just any of these things, but it was the combination of all of them together that pushed her past a tipping point where she could no longer do something that she really enjoyed. She had functional decline, as a geriatrician would say, and often that leads to loss of independence. Um, this combination of factors, as Eric alluded to, uh, diseases of aging tend to go together. You get many of them at the same time. Another example of this, heart failure, uh, is a common medical problem among older adults that often contributes to functional decline. But it's never just the heart failure. It turns out that 99% of older adults with heart failure have other chronic diseases too, often many of them, four, six, a dozen or more. How do you help people like this? Uh, well, you could try to, to whack every mole. You could try to treat all of their 12 chronic diseases as powerfully as you can. But in reality, when you try to do that, you often wind up doing more harm than good. The art of being a geriatrician, in large part, is about trying to identify what is the one really important problem that if I focus on, on that and try to fix that, I'll improve the whole person. Um, but what if, it'd still be nice if there were a better way. Therapies targeted at aging might offer that better way. Uh, if aging is the common risk factor for many of these chronic diseases, whose effects together add up to functional decline, loss of independence, well, maybe by targeting aging, we can delay or prevent uh, or at least ameliorate many of those diseases simultaneously and so have an outsized effect on a person's function. Uh, that's multimorbidity, addressing multimorbidity, and that's one clinical strategy for using therapies developed from aging. So from there, I'll step into the lab for a minute and give you a couple of, uh, describe a couple ways in which we're trying to develop new therapeutics, uh, and then I'll close by going back to Nan. So Eric mentioned uh, a couple of really astounding things that, that I still find really cool, uh, that aging is regulated, and that the pathways uh, and the interventions that can regulate aging are often shared in common across the tree of life, across evolution, from worms and flies to mice and us. Um, now, one of those common interventions is dietary restriction or fasting. Uh, fortunately for us, especially with the nice reception I think we have planned afterwards, uh, the benefits of dietary restriction we're learning more and more are not about eating less, per se but rather eating less is a powerful biological signal that turns on lots of downstream pathways. And these downstream pathways in turn implement, so to speak, the health benefits of fasting and dietary restriction. So if we can understand those downstream pathways, we can design therapeutics that will capture some of that benefit. So we work on, on two particular examples of this. One is a group of enzymes called sirtuins. Um, sirtuins are, are really interesting enzymes that sense the metabolic state inside of your cells as it reflects the metabolic state of your body. Um, and since sirtuins are enzymes, then they go on to modify lots of other proteins um, and have a bunch of effects throughout your cell. Uh, and two of those effects are to help your mitochondria work more efficiently um, and also to reprogram your gene expression, epigenetic regulation of your genes. Uh, another thing we work on in the lab similarly uh, are molecules called ketone bodies. So these are molecules that you make in your own bodies from your fat cells, um, and if you're exercising or if you're fasting, uh, they help to supply energy to the rest of your body in place of sugar. Um, so that sounds pretty boring. They're just carriers of energy. Uh, but Eric's lab found out a couple years ago that they're actually signals too. They're natural drugs, so to speak, that inhibit a group of enzymes called histone deacetylases. These histone deacetylases also regulate epigenetically your gene expression. They turn genes on and off in certain circumstances. So both sirtuins and ketone bodies are examples of this broad idea of how signals from the environment, like what and how you're eating, can reach into your cells and epigenetically regulate gene expression to control your health and control aging. Um, so our hope is that by gaining a deep understanding of how these things work at the molecular level, what genes are being turned on and off, how and what circumstances and what tissues, we can intelligently design therapeutics that will capture some of that health benefit and then give it to people who need it, uh, people like my nan. Um, so I already told you one circumstance in which uh, this is being explored clinically for treatment of multimorbidity. Uh, briefly, I'll introduce you to another idea, a related one, that of resilience. Um, so when I'm in the hospital, one of the starkest differences between a 40-year-old and a 92-year-old like nan is now is that when everything goes well for a 40-year-old, they walk out the door and go home. When everything goes really well for a 92-year-old, they're still probably going to be wheeled out to a nursing home, at least temporarily, if not more. Uh, it turns out that half of disability in older adults is associated with hospitalizations, even when things go really well. Uh, and why is that? Just like, just like with Nan not being able to garden, it's never just one thing, but it's a combination of many different factors, many of which 
uh, for which aging is the underlying risk. Uh, losing muscle more fat or losing muscle more quickly when you're immobile, not gaining that muscle back as fast when you're rehabilitating, getting confused, uh, cognitive impairment worsening, lots of different things. And the hope is that tar uh, therapies targeted at aging will address many of those simultaneously and boost the resilience of older adults to make it more likely that they'll emerge from the hospital in as good a shape as they were before they got sick. Um, or at least that they'll be able to rehabilitate better and get back to where they were faster. Um, so these are two scenarios, treatment of multimorbidity uh, and improving resilience to overcome acute medical problems uh, for which interventions that target aging are actually in clinical trials right now or the clinical trials are being designed, uh, including using metformin and another drug called rapamycin. So this is a very exciting time to be in the field of aging research, uh, a very exciting time at Gladstone. We're in the center of it. Um, and with that, I'll pass the microphone to, uh, uh, to show me who will tell you about uh, in much more detail about one particular system of the body uh, that's profoundly affected by aging, and that is our immune system. So as, as you all know, um, our, um, our immune system is central to keeping us healthy, keeping us um, uh, safe from infectious diseases, um, from cancers, um, believe it or not, um, tumors are controlled by the immune system. And, um, and so it, the, the, the whole process is a very orchestrated process, and it involves um, two different arms. One is the innate arm, the other is the adaptive arm. The innate arm involves the, um, your innate cells that are the, fir the front line of, of um, trying to protect us from um, infectious um, agents. And what these innate cells do is they, uh, first of all, they have to recognize a pathogen as a dangerous organism um, versus, for example, one that lives inside of us, inside of our gut, like the commensals. So their job, the innate cells, their job is to recognize a dangerous pathogen, engulf it, destroy it, but meanwhile, what they do is they, they sent out these inflammatory mediators to the rest of the body to try to recruit adaptive immune cells to the, to the vicinity of where the infection is occurring. And so, um, and, and, so, and then what they do is then they present parts of the, the infectious uh, material to the adaptive cells. Now, the adaptive cells are, are made up of two different components. One are the B cells that are responsible for producing antibodies against um, the infectious agent. And what they do, these antibodies will neutralize the pathogen that allows it, and that allows the innate cells to recognize it and, and, and eat it up and destroy it much faster. Now the other, other arm of the adaptive immune response are the T cells, which are the helper CD4 T cells and, and the, the killer CD8 T cells. The job of the helper T cells is to help both the B cells and the killer T cells by again recognizing the type of pathogen or the type of organism that has invaded our body or the type of cancer, and, and, and they in return um, send out um, appropriate inflammatory cytokines to, again, initiate the right type of response and to activate these um, killer T cells to, for example, come and identify the infected cells and, and destroy them. Now, one of the major components of the adaptive immune response is what's called immunological memory. And what happens is that some of these cells that, that, that um, help to clear the infection will end up living in our body for the rest of our lives. And, and, and what is really fascinating is they live in different, in different areas. Um, most of us used to think that these memory cells live in our blood, but now what we're finding is that they actually end up living where they first saw the or original infection. So if, if it was a skin rash or if it was, you know, wherever the infection initially was, these memory cells will live in that area for the rest of, uh, for the rest of our life. And what they do is as soon as they see the infection again, very quickly and very robustly, they respond to, to the infection to the point where sometimes we don't even know that we were reinfected with the same pathogen. So this is a concept of vaccination. This is why we get vaccinated. So the vaccine mimics the primary infection. So this, when you actually do get infected with a pathogen, or um, then your body can respond to it much more quickly. However, what happens is, unfortunately, as we age, 
um, our, our immune system undergoes what's called immunosenescence. And so it, both the innate and adaptive part of the immune response lose their ability to function as they normally would. So the innate cells are not as good as gulping up um, the pathogens that come in and the, the, the B cells are not producing as good of antibodies and the T cells are not doing their killing as, um, as they should. And as a result, there's a lot of diseases that are related to aging, such as, for example, um, as you know, uh, um, flu, for example, affects the older population much more than it does the younger population. Or inflammatory diseases, as Eric mentioned, like um, type 2 diabetes, or even autoimmune diseases like um, rheumatoid arthritis. And, and, and especially cancers, where the, our immune system, as it breaks down, it no longer can fight these um, these various things. Now, um, what um, what the scientists are trying to do is they're trying to really, and what my lab focuses on is really trying to understand the mechanism, uh, the, the molecular mechanism of how these T cells, how these memory T cells are developed. How do they function? Where do they reside? What is the specificity of the pathogen versus the root of the infection versus what are the requirements to make the perfect memory cell that can, that can continue to protect us um, instead of making inflammation? Because one of the components of the age uh, immune system is, um, is that the, these uh, innate cells overproduce some of these inflammatory cytokines. And it's not totally understood why this is happening, but one of the theories is that, for example, some viruses that um, that infect us chronically, which don't don't really affect us um, in healthy individuals, such, such as CMV, for example. The background immune system that's constantly working to keep us to keep the virus at a bay is generating a lot of inflammation in the body. And as we get older, our, 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 immune, our immune cells just get tired. And, that, and, and that's one of the thoughts that it's just that they become very senescent and, and, and they're no longer functioning. So, and, and this um, excess inflammation can have um, effect not just on the immune system, but also on other parts of the body. For example, the brain, as, we'll as, as Lee will, uh, will tell us more about how this, um, this chronic inflammation can actually affect what's going on in our brain. So, um, so really, to try to understand um, how the immune system ages and what are the what are the memory cells that are protective versus versus the ones that are super inf inflammatory is, is is what we focus on um, in our lab. And and there are examples. For example, one of the pathways that John talked about. Uh, um, for example, if you block mTOR using an analog of rapamycin, which which blocks one of these pathways that are involved in aging, um, and you do that during vaccination in older, um, in older individuals, the, the, the vaccine actually works much better. So if you block some of these pathways during vaccination, you can improve the immune response that's elicited. And so as a result, these people are better protected and, and will um, most likely um, you know, have a healthier, at least winter. <laughs> All right, with that, I'll, I'll introduce um, Lee, who's going to tell you about how some of this inflammation can actually affect, um, for example, uh, what, what goes on in our brain. So um, as you heard from the previous speakers, um, Eric, um, the key word here is healthy aging, so, um, which cannot be achieved without a healthy mind. Um, so you may have noticed that um, the cognitive function, um, the gap of the cognitive function widens substantially as we age. Some of us maintain at high, high levels, uh, not including me, um, and some of some of us unfortunately do not. Um, and in the worst case is uh, dementia, such as Alzheimer disease, um, which is developed at accelerated rates uh, when we uh, grow older. So um, this aging-related uh, cognitive decline um, and dementia-related uh, cognitive de decline, um, I will refer to today as cognitive aging, um, just for simplicity. So uh, in the next few minutes, I want to tell you some of the ongoing research we, we are doing here at Glasson and in my laboratory to disrupt uh, cognitive aging. So um, what, is, what are the mechanisms? So what causes cognitive aging? Like other aging-related um, processes, 
cognitive aging is driven by interplay of genetic and environmental factors. And uh, um, that leads to cognitive decline via a cascade of mechanisms. And one such mechanism that I'm focusing on and introduced by Xiaomi and, uh, and Zhang is uh, the immune system. So as Xiaomi mentioned, um, immune system is responsible for our ability to fight against infections, which are often associated uh, with inflammatory responses and inflammation, the swelling, the redness, etc. cetera. Um, however, in aging brain and in dementia, um, this inflammatory state uh, persists, then leading to a chronic inflammation. And we can detect this state of chronic inflammation um, with factors um, show me introduced uh, called pro-inflammatory cytokines. And cytokines are small molecule proteins um, that immune cells use to communicate with each other, and, but also communicate with other cells and in the brain and to communicate with, uh, with neurons. So, um, so what happens, um, you know, to, to those um, uh, immune system? You know, what we want to understand is what are those um, immune factors or, or pro-inflammatory cytokines do? And studies have shown that and, um, the levels of those inflammatory factors are elevated uh, in aging, in aging brain. And what is most also quite intriguing is that there is a negative correlation of the levels of those inflammatory cytokines with the memory. So the higher the levels and the worse off those, pa those people are. So you may say, oh, this is correlation, and correlation does not equal causality, and that's exactly what we think in the lab as well. So what we want to find out is which of those factors are the driving force, not just bystanders, and how those, driving, uh, how those factors that are driving force are upregulated, and what can we do about it? So now I'm going to bring you to the lab. Um, so we... The, our starting point is, what is the source of this brain inflammation? And locally, in the brain, the inflammation is produced by the immune cells in the brain, which are different from the immune cell cells that uh, Shomi mentioned in the periphery. And we call them glia. So glia are the cells surrounding neurons and often traditionally are considered to be not important for cognition, and neurons are the center of the universe. Um, but this view has been challenged, and actually uh, um, several labs at Glassstone uh, have been at the forefront of this challenge, and work from Leonard Mookie's lab showing that one type of the glia uh, is critical for ability to forget, and uh, the uh, drugs that, uh, such as caffeine can target these cells, and that leads to enhanced memory. So let's come back to aging. So what happens to those immune cells in aging? And not surprisingly, they age too. So we wanted to understand the molecular pathways that uh, happens in those aged immune cells. So we isolated those immune cells from old mice and from young mice, and we compa uh, com compare them gen uh, unbiasedly using um, their, their expression profiles, and then performed uh, analysis using bioinformatics tools. And one pathway or one network emerged from this analysis is one family of uh, these inflammatory cytokines. And the center, the central player of this family is actually a cytokine that has been shown to be critical for memory. So if you put more of those cytokines in the brain, in the mouse brain, the mouse actually have impaired memory. So we then dig deeper. So what drives the, the, the uh, uh, upregulation of this cytokine. And then I'm going to return to the epigenetics uh, concept. So it turns out that um, the upregulation is linked to a loss of a chemical modification on the genome of the cytokine, so-called epigenetic changes, which normally act as silencers, or you could call it breaks, to its expression. So with aging, the loss of the break, or silencer, of, uh, in, this, in, the, in the aged immune cells, make, um, prime them, if you call it, mechanically, or almost literally, to make them more vulnerable um, to response to additional insults uh, occur in Alzheimer's disease as well as um, in other dementia. So we think that 
you know, this is one of the molecular underpinnings that drives the chronic inflammation that actually is a weakened breaks um, on the epigenetic level that control the expression of some of those critical uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So can we do something about it? And the answer is yes. Actually, um, we are very excited that one of the enzymes that um, is associated with longevity um, in the lower organisms and can be upregulated by fasting, unfortunately, and dietary restriction is actually enhancer of this modification on the epigenetic level. So it can enhance the modification, uh, strengthen the break um, to this pro-inflammatory cytokine to suppress expression. And in mouse models, we found that this enzyme actually not only lead to um, suppression of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also improve memory uh, in the mouse model uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we're very uh, ex or encouraged by this exciting opportunities of targeting the immune cell, immune system in the brain uh, to disrupt uh, cognitive aging. And going forward, um, we wanted to understand um, more further define um, the aged immune cells, both molecularly and functionally, and then find out or develop strategies or even find a compound that can rejuvenate um, our aged immune system in the brain and to disrupt uh, cognitive aging. With that, I want to uh, turn the microphone to Christina. So we heard from multiple of the previous speakers that the changes that we see in aging is a regulated process. And in Deepak Srivastava's lab here at Gladstone, uh, one of the things that we study are the changes that are regulated that we see in gene networks uh, over aging. So my research focuses on a disease that affects the heart valves, hardening them with calcification over time, uh, leading to a narrowing of the valves such that blood cannot flow properly from the heart to the body. And this leads to over 100,000 valve transplants annually in the United States alone. Uh, so this heart disease increases in incidence with age. Uh, so up to 1 in 25 people over the age of 65 develop the disease. Our lab previously identified two families with this heart valve disease, and we found that they had mutations in one of two copies of a gene called NOTCH, leading to decreased dosage in NOTCH in the heart valves. However, why this decreased dosage of NOTCH led to heart valve disease was unknown. We cannot study this disease in mice because mice with mutations in one copy of NOTCH uh, do not develop disease. And so with the advent of induced pluripotent stem cell technology by Shinya Yamanaka, who is here at Gladstone, we're finally able to study this disease in human cells from the patients uh, that they themselves were affected by this disease by turning skin cells from these patients into stem cells and then turning those stem cells into the cells that line the heart valves. And so we could study these cells uh, from the patients in the dish. And so using this system, we were able to identify the gene networks that were altered due to decreased dosage in NOTCH. And we found that the abnormal calcification that occurs in the valves is due to the cells starting to think that they're bone and laying down calcium. Um, so uh, through, these, through this work, we're able to identify these gene networks and now we are doing a screen with about 2,000 small molecules to identify drugs in the dish um, that could correct the gene network changes that we see in patients with this heart valve disease. And our preliminary data shows that we may have one or more drugs that have already been FDA approved uh, for other purposes that may be successful gene network correctors in the dish in these human cells. Um, however, we still do not have an animal model in which to test these drugs that we identified through the screen. So this started me thinking uh, back to what I said previously. Uh, so why do mice not develop the same disease that humans do when they lose one copy of this gene, Notch? Um, so this led me to thinking about telomeres. Uh, so on the end of each of our chromosomes, there's uh, pieces of DNA that cap the chromosomes and prevent their deterioration. So they protect the chromosomes. Um, and so these 
uh, telomeres on the ends of the chromosomes shorten with each cell division. So over all the cell divisions that occur throughout our lifetime, the telomeres shorten with age. Uh, and this has been linked to multiple age-related diseases. Uh, so since, as I told you before, this heart valve disease incidence increases with age, I wondered whether this age-related telomere shortening was playing a role in this disease process. Um, so it turns out that indeed in humans that have heart valve disease, their telomeres are shorter than healthy people that are the same age. Um, and I knew that in laboratory mice, their telomeres are much longer than in humans. So I wondered whether these longer telomeres were protecting the mice from the heart valve disease that occurs in humans. Uh, so to test this, I genetically shortened the telomeres of notch mutant mice. And uh, after doing this, it, we found that these mice now do develop the same heart valve calcification that occurs in human disease. So this provides us with an opportunity to test any successful gene network correctors that we find from the drug screen in the human cells in the dish in an animal model, and as well as further studying the role of telomere shortening that occurs in age-related diseases. Uh, so through this work, we hope to identify an effective therapy to uh, prevent or delay the uh, heart valve disease in humans and as well as to further understand the role of age-related telomere shortening in diseases that affect us as we age. So, thank you. Okay, uh, it's question and answer time. And I'm going to invite Lynn Mookie, uh, Deepak Sivasana, and Eric Burden to join me on the stage. These gentlemen. Okay, hello? Okay, good. Uh, these gentlemen represent each of Gladstone's three composite institutes for heart, brain, and virology, immunology. Uh, we've heard from uh, some of our other colleagues, and we can address questions to them too. But I thought I'd have our most senior scientists on stage to take the first round of questions. Bill Price. Eric, you mentioned a drug, I think you said metformin, uh, that had shown some promising signs of uh, extending life. Do you take this drug? And, 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 and if not, why not? And if so, where do you get it? <laughs> Ex excellent question. My, my mic is working. So actually, uh, and this is a true story, I just asked my GP. Uh, what would be the downside of taking it? And uh, because I, I told them, and looking at the data, it's one giant study, so it, it's not a prospective study. And you know, in medicine, the, the key question is first, do no harm. And I think this is what I would tell everybody when you consider taking a drug for the rest of your life. So uh, metformin has some uh, side effect in, in a number of people, and uh, but in a number of people, there's absolutely no side effects. So the key is really to make that decision and to jump. One, I'll, I'll say one more thing before we go to the next question. One thing that's actually is remarkable, so I'm 58 years old, and you might think, you know, this might be too late for you to start <laughs> taking medicine. Um, all of the studies that... So. <laughs> I knew that. <laughs> So one of the, the, the things that's emerged from the studies in using small molecules that delay aging in mice is that you can administer them quite late. And one of the drugs we've heard about is rapamycin, uh, which is an immunosuppressant. You can give these mice at the equivalent of 60 years old and still increase lifespan by 20%. I think so that, uh, that might alleviate the concerns that would be to give a, a drug to someone for, for their whole life, not knowing whether it's going to be uh, making them better. Well, I'm Holly Smith, and I'm 91 years old, but <laughs> so I'm not. <laughs> but I want to know what what is the current status of these reports of parabiosis uh, between mice and rats. And I find myself looking avariciously at my grandsons <laughs> as to what 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 do I could steal from them to. Maybe you could report what those things are. 
So, um, is this on? Yeah. So, you know, these are really fascinating studies that uh, were initiated by Tony Viscore at Stanford University. And Tony came from my lab originally and um, built this fantastic program up uh, at, at Stanford. And uh, they are now engaged in clinical trials, actually, of giving young plasma to people with early stage Alzheimer's disease. And uh, certainly in the mouse models, it looks incredibly interesting. Uh, clearly, there seem to be factors in that young blood that can transfer and uh, improve the brain function of these old mice in which it has been tested. So, uh, you know, there may be hope in sight for all of us. And if uh, we can identify the factors that are involved, one may be able to convert this into uh, small molecule drugs. At the moment, we're talking about proteins, and you know, the, the plasma infusions obviously are not so straightforward to do on a large scale, but it is certainly fascinating work. So uh, this uh, idea of parabiosis, which is a term used, is experiments where if you sew a young mouse together with an old mouse and they share their blood and their serum, then something gets transferred from the young mouse to the old mouse that makes it young again. Uh, so the, the beauty of those experiments is it proves that there's something uh, in uh, young animals that could be you know, transmitted to an older animal to make it young. And it's been useful for brain things and also for the heart. Uh, groups have sown uh, young mice that have normal hearts with old mice that have uh, heart failure and uh, rescued the heart failure in the older mice through some factor that's circulating and the, then the challenge is to identify that factor so you don't have to sew two people together. Because I'm sure your grandson, I know your grandson, he worked in my lab, but, and he loves you, but he doesn't want to be <laughs> with you all the time. But so the hope sure would be to could... find that factor and then we could administer it instead. I think he may not, not be able to keep up with you, Holly. <laughs> Uh, on this note, so that uh, many groups now have, have jumped on this parabiosis, and a group at, at Berkeley, uh, Irina Conboy, has just identified a, um, a small peptide called oxytocin as one of the factors that controls aging. And the really interesting thing about oxytocin is it's also called the hormone of love and bonding. So this is the hormone that uh, generates bonding between mother and, and children or, or husband and wife. And the interesting aspect is the, the fact that, uh, that uh, I mentioned all the factors that, de that contribute to long life, especially community and social support. And no one really, you know, it's always been considered sort of fringe science, but now we understand that oxytocin per se itself is a factor that contributes to longevity. And we start making connection between things that we never thought we could from a biological standpoint. I'm wondering whether you're doing any research in, in scleroderma and how, if it's progressing at all as a cure. <laughs> well, scleroderma is, is a disease in which you have excessive fibrosis, and fibrosis is a hallmark of aging. Uh, to be honest, I, I do not work on, fibro on, on scleroderma, and I think no one does here. Uh, be interested to look into it to see uh, what is the link to aging. But I mean, it is an exagger exaggerated form of one of the manifestations of aging, which is extra excess fibrosis. This is what contributes to decrease skin elasticity, decrease uh, vascular uh, uh, elasticity as well, uh, increase uh, rigidity in the muscle and so on. There are a lot of trials uh, ongoing right now. Uh, you know, there's, I, I'm originally from Europe, and I think so is Le Leonard, and I think both Germany and Belgium, I know, have long histories of, of chronic fasting. Many, many people in my family actually do uh, uh, episodic fasting. There are lots of uh, historical uh, references to fasting in, in, in you know, religious orders, and many, many groups actually have fasting as a way of life. So I think there's a lot of... Um, People are looking back at this and really testing it now uh, um, uh, in a scientific way, in a prospective study. And I think uh, there's—I'm uh, personally on a on a on a two 
they are weak fast. It's called a 4-3 diet. I don't know if you've heard about this, and I highly recommend it. Although I'm European, I don't quite subscribe to that notion. <laughs> I'm, um, and my family hasn't either, I must say, and yet they, they're quite long-lived. So I'm hoping for Lee and Eric to you know, take some of the scientific insights that have emerged from these diet studies and convert them into a pill I can pop and eat all I want. <laughs> That I think sort of that that's the that, that's the hope. But I mean seriously, I think that it's very important that we understand all the different mechanisms that underlie the fasting effects, and hopefully that will in fact result in pills that you know would make it easier for people. Because as you know, the statins that probably some of you are taking, um, you know, they're a great way to be able to sometimes have a nice steak anyways. And so if we could, you know, have several other aspects of the aging process um, nailed with medication, I think it would certainly be welcomed by at least some of the lazy bums among us, so <laughs> me included. Yeah. Eric, how, how do you address the uh, question that skeptics raise in uh, trying to apply results from short-lived species like mice to longer-lived species like humans? Uh, I remember uh, a lot of controversy came up in the field of uh, uh, free radical uh, biology. Uh, one could argue that organisms like parrots or whales or humans that can live 100 years have already evolved the kinds of mechanisms that are only induced by fasting or other interventions in short-lived animals. How do you address that? It's a long, long answer. Um, I, I think, you know, if you look at a, a mice, for example, it lives only about three years, but its heart beats at 600 beats per minute. So if you think about a uh, short-lived animal do everything much faster. The metabolic rate is, is faster and so on. So I think there's, uh, we think about them as an accelerated version of what we're doing. So the evidence points to the fact that whatever we learn in these models, including in C. elegans, so C. elegans is a little worm, which is about one millimeter, grows in your garden, lives normally 20 days. And many of the, the pathways that, I mean, actually, most of the pathways that have been identified in this organism have translated into uh, humans and uh, into mice. Now, the big question, uh, there's a lot of questions, is, will this apply to humans? There's a priori no reason why it shouldn't. But again, medicine being what it is, is first do no harm. I think there's a lot of reluctance to, to put a young person on an anti-aging medicine. And I think this is not likely to happen. Aging is not considered a disease, not con considered a, an indication for actually putting someone on a medicine, basically. Uh, but um, chronic conditions that we've talked about, I think, could, could become one of those. Uh, at the other extreme, I'll say one more word about calorie restriction, which uh, actually uh, there's a whole group of people who are calorie restriction. This is a little more extreme than what I've told you. I do this episodic fasting, and some skeptical colleagues have made the point. So calorie restriction is decreasing your calorie input by 30%, uh, which is pretty tough. And some people have argued that uh, calorie restriction might not make, make you live longer as a human, but it will certainly feel that way. And uh, so... <laughs> On this, I will end. I just had a question over the blue spots you consider Loma Linda and Okinawa and such. Do they fast on a regular basis? Is that their tradition? Can you repeat that? And so the question is whether the people who've been identified in the um, communities, uh, the blue zone, for example, do they fast or do they eat less? Um, at least for one very well-defined group, the Okinawans, yes. There's, a, for those of you who speak Japanese, there's a saying in Japanese which is hara hachibu, which means only eat 80% of what you would need to feel, to, 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 be, to be satiated and to, to have enough. And so there's a, there, typically a lot of people in, in those areas, actually first they, they did not have enough food and eventually they grew, they grew it as, a, as part of their culture. They, they, they restrict their food. Um, Here's a question here. Uh, we've, as a society, have been increasing the treatment of diseases for a long time, increasing, uh, age, increasing our ages that way. But this is the first time there's been really a lot of work on aging itself and the mechanisms. And this isn't exactly Gladstone's business, but is there a group 
within Gladstone or without Gladstone, which is exploring all the social, economic, and moral consequences of your work. Um, these are very important questions uh, that I think we all appreciate. The, the consequences of extending average human lifespan by 25 years would be almost unimaginable how our social systems, our legal system, uh, our environment could deal with that. So I think uh, uh, it's incumbent upon us as a society to address these questions in parallel. Uh, however, we at Gladstone uh, are focused on trying to understand the biology. Um, we certainly would uh, seek, as we do in the stem cell arena and in other areas, to be um, spokespersons for appropriate moral actions and uh, to protect society. Uh, but human curiosity being what it is, uh, I think we're driven uh, by our very natures to try to understand the world that we live in and try to control those things that we find harmful. Uh, I certainly would like to see a world where uh, we all can function like Holly Smith at age 91. Uh, so we know it's possible. Uh, and now we're learning that there are things that circulate in the blood or cells or things that we might do that we could come closer to that. I'd like to give society those options and trust that we can make wise decisions on how to regulate and adapt otherwise uh, to what would be quite significant change. We've got one last question here. Oh, okay, two. One over there and then here. What, what do you think the role of the microbiota, the gut microbiota is in the process of regulating aging? It's not been studied in a, in a direct way, although there's, there's a lot of interest in the field in, in the way that the, your microbiota influences uh, a, a lot of the conditions that we know are associated with aging. For example, you know, the meta, so-called metabolic syndrome, obesity, type, type 2 diabetes are all strongly influenced by your microbiota. And the last is also, this is one of the key, about biggest fr fraction of your immune system, and we've heard about from Show Me that your immune system is, uh, chronic inflammation is, is thought to be one of the shared mechanisms from all of these conditions. So having a healthy immune system is largely dependent on your microbiota. So I think there's a lot of interest in, in the area. Yeah, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with what that means, the microbiota are the microorganisms that live on and in us. And uh, it's quite shocking, actually. Uh, each of us in this room probably has somewhere between three and six pounds of such things uh, living in us. And in fact, <clears throat> there are more of them than there are of us in terms of just numbers of cells. But increasingly, we're learning we can't think of ourselves apart from them because many biochemical pathways that affect our brains, our hearts, pass through these organisms at some point in all the things that make us us. So it becomes ever more complicated. It, it's a really important question, and it turns out that there's more uh, DNA from the bacteria that live on and in you than your DNA that makes up you. Uh, and so understanding what that is and how that interplay uh, with our own cells occurs is critical to many diseases. And one of our faculty here, uh, uh, Katie Pollard is a computational biologist, and uh, so she is uh, involved. There's a national uh, microbiome project to try to understand this, and she's the main driver of the uh, computational side of sorting out if you sequence the DNA of all these bacteria, uh, then how do you figure out what those bacteria are and how they're interplaying with our own DNA, and she's at the forefront of that uh, computational effort to understand all these different bacteria that are uh, a critical part uh, of our existence and also play a critical role in so many different diseases. Here's our last question. I read recently that there was a longitudinal study in the United Kingdom that said um, if you're overweight, um, you have an 18% uh, less chance of getting Alzheimer's, and if you're obese, it's 24% chance of uh, better than, than average of um, not suffering from Alzheimer's. Now, have you read that study? Did you see that? Because I was wondering, it's such a seeming paradox, 
paradoxical. Yeah, it's paradoxical. What you're Actually, yeah. there are lots of studies that would point in the opposite direction that uh, would suggest, you know, that uh, obesity and particularly metabolic syndrome and diabetes associated with obesity can be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So I would be rather skeptical about those findings. And uh, I haven't read this particular study, but I think there are lots of studies that really point in the opposite direction. Maybe before we close, I wanted to bring up one other topic that didn't come up in the questions, but I thought it might. And this is this notion that as uh, we age, uh, why is it that all many different organs uh, sort of start falling apart? And we've heard many different reasons, and I think it's probably multifactorial. One area we haven't talked about is the fact that e most organs uh, are replenishing themselves throughout a lifetime. They get damaged, they fix themselves. They, there are cells that sort of repair and uh, replace old cells. And uh, one aspect of aging is that as you get older, these pools of cells that are in each organ that are meant to replace and replenish uh, stop functioning. And these are essentially stem cells or those kind of cells in each of the organs. And so uh, these cells sort of go away or stop working as you get older. So if you could unlock why that happens and sort of replace those or preserve them in a good state, then many of the organs could continue replenishing and repairing themselves longer uh, to create healthier organs as we age. Well, thank you all for your attention, and now uh, we'll enjoy some food and drink. Good mix of science and what they want to hear. You can see the interest. I know.